So it wasn't like, you know, we're doing this band, let's use my thing that I do with Dashboard for us. You know, it wasn't like done that way, like intentionally as far as we go. But, to, you know, people still ask about it and it's part of my history. You know, it's the part of my start in music. Welcome, everyone. This was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, go over to my Instagram at This Was The Scene and give it a follow and share it with someone who also wants to follow it, and that would be fantastic. The Rocking Horse winner was an American indie rock band based in Davie, Florida. Formed in mid-99 and toured with Dashboard Confessional, Coed in Cambria, The Format, Bayside, The Blood Brothers, The Weaker Thins, Further Seems Forever, Midtown, and a ton more. Also, you may remember Jolie's background vocals in some of the OG Dashboard songs. Thank you, Casey Iodine, for the intro, so I got Jolie on the Skype, and this is what we chat about. Her new band, The Darling Fire, Having Stage Fright, How She Got Connected with Dashboard, Being on Equal Vision, Hank Shaw's Antics at Fest, Mac Rock, The Coheed Story, the Crazy House in Florida story, being in Seventeen magazine, did dating someone in the band cause riffs, how scrappy of a band were they, and a ton more. Check out her new band, The Darling Fire's new album, Distortions, available today on Iodine Recordings. The band features members of The Rocking Horse Winner, Shy Halud, Further Seems Forever, and As Friends Rust. It's available on several vinyl variants and CD from Iodine Recordings at iodinerecords.com or at Deathwish Inc. along with new merch designs. That's all I gotta say, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. I just gotta give Casey a shout out for yet another intro to uh, another interview that uh, <laughs> that I'm doing. How do you know Casey? Apparently, you know, I don't really remember that much from back in the day, but apparently he actually was involved in the CMJ showcase that we played for EVR, my old band, The Rocking Horse Winner. So he was kind of working with EVR at the time. More recently, he started kind of like following my new band on uh, socials. And after that, you know, I kind of, you know, looked into what he was doing and reached out to him and said, you know, we were working on this album. Would How would you feel about putting it out? We actually had only written some of it at that point. And so he said that he actually wasn't looking to release anything new at the time, but um, that he would listen to it. And after he did listen to some of the demos and he was like, yeah, I want to put this out. So that's how that whole thing kind of started. Yeah, I've been listening to it. It's really good. It's very, um, I feel like your style, and I could be wrong because I've, I've only heard a little bit of the Rocking Horse Winter. You have like this kind of a moody, like very melodic tone. And it's like, it's awesome. I, I like styles like that. Is that something that you, it's just kind of like, just you've always had? Because I mean, I definitely want to talk about like the whole dashboard thing and you doing the background for that and collaborating back then. But, and I think I remember, and I forget what song, what, refresh my memory, what song it was that you sang on or songs you sang on with him? There were a few songs, but the main song that I guess that I wrote the backup for was Age Six Racer. That's the one that people most recognize because some of them I'm just like kind of in, mixed in there, but that's probably the one that is most recognizable as far as my voice being in it. Um, so it was Age Six Racer. Let me listen to that real quick. You're not going to hear it on sure. your end, but I just want to remember what that song sounds Sure, like. sure, sure. Yeah, so I remember because I, I was like, oh, I remember the female vocals in that album, and I never knew who it was. But I remembered like in my brain, I was like, yeah. And then I was listening to your new stuff in there. So there's this like very somber kind of, you know, say, I don't know if moody sounds like it's negative because I'm just not trying to. No, be that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So is that like just been like your style forever? I guess so. I mean, I don't really try to do anything specific. It just comes out that way, I guess. I don't know. I just naturally, I don't like to like belt everything, I guess you could say. I don't like to like, even for this band, because this band's very loud, obviously compared to the other things that I had done before. And even over this band, I didn't, it wasn't like intentional. It's just that it feels natural to me to kind of have that like that contrast of like the soft with the heavy. And then there are times for belting and, and then times where you just want to be like intimate with the listener and be like, you know, more quiet. So I guess it's just like a natural thing for me. I, that's just how I've always sang. It's pro- it probably comes from, you know, different all different music that I've listened to and influences, but I guess, I guess it's just the way that I do it. <laughs> yeah, I've brought it up a couple times in 
I was like talking to someone recently and we were talking about how when they start writing, even now, it's been so long since they played, they still have that, their style still comes through. And I don't, I think for people who sing or write songs, I think that there's always just this internal thing that they can't get rid of. It's like, this is just what I bring to the table. I can't try to be something different. If I do, it sounds so off and it sounds just so unnatural. Totally. And I mean, it, even getting to the point where these songs are that we have coming out, even getting to that point was interesting for me because I had to challenge myself a little bit to, um, so my, I guess my style did develop a little bit into something different. Um, but I guess the, you know, what I had been doing before still comes through no matter what. <laughs> so, yeah. And also I just wanted to point out too, that the, your drummer, Steve, how do you say his last name? <laughs> Kleiseth? Kleiseth. Kleiseth. He's like one of my favorite fucking drummers ever. He's so yeah. goddamn good. Yeah, he's definitely a beast. <laughs> but he's like so calm. Like I've seen videos of him playing for Further Seems Forever. And then I didn't know he was in Shy Halud at one point. Yeah, totally. Yep. And it's like when you watch him, he has this funky stuff, but he just seems calm the whole time. But just it just his hands are all over the place. I'm like, fuck, man. This guy's amazing. Yeah, he's definitely extremely talented. We're really lucky to have him. And you guys, he was in Rocking Horse Winter for a minute, I'm reading. Is that right? Yeah, it's funny because <laughs> our drummer, um, he filled in for our drummer for, a, I think it was a show. I, I don't know if it was more than one show. And he literally learned the songs on his lap, basically, before the show and then just played the shit out. <laughs> Jesus. I don't, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like a last minute thing. So he's, yeah, he's, so he he's really talented and he can just pull it out, basically. <laughs> Well, that's like, it's going to be cool to talk about because this, this whole podcast goes back to the, it talks about the late 90s, early 2000s. And usually I like to talk to people who did something, started somehow in the 90s and it bled into the, the 2000s, even though the 2000s might have been where they did the bulk of the thing that they, their music career. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking through this and I was looking a little, doing a little Googling with your name and seeing where you popped up. The, you know, the fact that you grew up in the Florida scene is going to be great to talk about because I've interviewed a bunch of Florida bands. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go back to the origins of how you got involved in the scene and then talk about your bands and like the whole, you know, I'll talk about the dashboard thing, talk about uh, Rock and Horse Winter and then up till now and then talk about like what that band's career was like and what you were, how you saw the scene in, in the early 2000s before like that band broke up. So to start off, like I do all interviews, how did you get involved in the scene? I actually grew up for the first part of my life in New York on Long Island, actually. So I kind of was like in between the New York hardcore scene and the Florida scene in like the mid to late 90s, I guess. Wait, so you were living in Long Island when you were a teen? Yes. Um, up until I moved to Florida, I was in, I came from Long Island. When I would go back from college to visit, I would go to shows in the city with friends. And uh, so I kind of like witnessed the, the New York hardcore scene at that time, too. Do you remember what shows you were seeing? Totally. Uh, quicksand, um, Face to Face. And then I, I was also listening to a lot of punk then. So I would go to just punk shows. And yeah, I mean, even that was amazing. You know, when I was in Florida... I just kind of, I went to college down here and... Where'd you go? FAU. What's that? Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic University. And that's kind of like where I met the friends that would then lead into this whole thing. So you got to Florida because you went to college or your family moved you there? My family actually intended to move to Florida. So they kind of like, I guess you could say like indirectly placed me here in a way, I guess you could say. Okay. You know, I had a choice of places to go, but I decided to come to Florida. I had I have family down here also, but they intended to come down here also, which they eventually did. So they were kind of influenced me coming down. But I had no intention to get involved in music. I was not in any way involved in bands or anything before I moved here. So you weren't singing at all prior to that? Just, you know at home <laughs> nothing really? you know nothing professionally yeah totally interesting nothing professionally yeah i didn't you know i didn't even it didn't even cross my mind to do that at all i can't remember exactly the first thing that started but i know that the first thing that i recorded was with chris caraba's first his early band uh, the vacant andes oh wow yeah so it was a, a cover of and she was by the talking heads and we recorded that, and James Wisner, I don't know if you know who James Wisner is. I don't. Producer? Okay. Um, he recorded 
the Rocking Horse albums. He recorded the de- early Dashboard albums. He recorded uh, early New Found Glory. Oh, wow. He also recorded, I think, at least one of the Paramore albums. But back then, it was just him in his apartment with a closet for vocals. And um, I remember, I still remember <laughs> recording those vocals for that backup on that song with them. How, wait, how did you get that, though? If you weren't singing, like, how do you go from not singing to all of a sudden just being like, hey, Chris Caraba, who I no one knows is going to become very famous one day, like, yeah. I want to sing in your band or background. That's the thing. I can't remember. I don't know if maybe I was just singing in general out loud and they heard some. I can't remember exactly how that kind of started. It's weird. I mean, that's where I can't remember like exactly the, the moment um, how that was sparked. But I'm, Chris and I were in a class together at one point. And then after that, we kind of became friends and, and in the same circle and everything. And then it just led to that, basically. Yeah. So that and that's what started everything for me. I mean, that led to um, Rocking Horse also and and the early dashboard stuff, because with Rocking Horse, they they heard the cover song and they liked my vocals on there. So they said, well, you know, do you want to try out for our band? And that was before we had a name or before we had that name. And that's how that all started. So how, okay, so you, so you do the background for Vacant Andes and then were you also going to local shows and kind of really getting involved in the scene at the time? Yeah, totally. I mean, the scene down here was amazing. Totally different now where there isn't really like a, like a scene like there was then. Um, everybody was kind of friends and playing shows together. And like, you can see how many bands came out of here at that time. I remember watching Newfound Glory play in like a donut shop, <laughs> like a coffee shop one time. And just, you know, everybody was friends and like Shia Lu, we knew that's how we met Steve. I mean, I met Steve through everybody back then and we would all hang out and, and just everybody would kind of like, like Oliver from Shia Lu was in our, in Rocking Horse for a while. So it's, it just was like a, a big family, I guess you could say, even though like the music was all kind of different, like Rocking Horse was different than Shai Halud and different than Newfound Glory. It was all in kind of like the same scene and we all played together and it didn't matter. Like it wasn't just like a punk show or like a hardcore show or like an emo show, you know, before that it was emo. What was your like style of music that you gravitated, gravitated to? I listened to a lot of like different stuff, but I guess like the, th- the albums that like I wore out were like, I mean, before all that stuff was like Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana. And then like I was listening to Rancid, like the early, like the first Rancid album. I listened to that nonstop. And then the first Caven album, I was obsessed with that. I listened to that nonstop. Completely different than what I was playing. (laughs) You know, we would play this like soft show and then I would go listen to that and just get like aggressive (laughs) Something, you know? <laughs> so um because I grew, because I was listening to a lot of New York hardcore and stuff like that at the time too. Which uh which cave in was that beyond hypothermia? Hypothermia. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, because then until your heart stops was next and that's when what's his face took over. They kicked out the one singer and then he then um the guitar player started doing like the deeper screaming shit. Yeah, and then after that, it was like kind of totally different. But that first album is the one that I listened to like crazy. Interesting. I mean, that's a that is a that's a hard to digest sound. I know it is. It's like all over the place with like the timings. the The time signatures are stra- are crazy. I mean, I just listened to it the other day when we were on that little mini this mini Florida run, and like listening to it after all those years and everything. It's like. And it's weird for me because I'm used to like, as you can see with most of the music that I do, it's like that we don't have all these crazy time signatures. So like my brain works in a certain way, but like with that, that was like the one uh, album that like I could listen to those crazy time signatures and all that weird shit going on. And I just loved it. When you were listening to this stuff and going to shows in Long Island before we moved to Florida, was there any point where you kind of thought to yourself, I'd like to be like fronting a band? Actually, no. I had, you know, really bad stage fright. Really? Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, even until now, I still get, you know, a little bit of that, but it's not as as bad as it was back then. But I would never have, my personality is more quiet and reserved, I guess you could say. Um, And so like, that was like the furthest thing (laughs) from from my mind, I guess. Jumping forward to like how you do it now, and we're going to jump back to that just for a second. 
How do you like it now? I love it. Interesting. Yeah, I love being on stage. It's like, it's like we just did this Florida run with Anthony Green, which was insane in itself. But holy shit! Wow. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty crazy because we hadn't played. That was the the shows that we did with him. We did two shows. We played two sh- two local shows the weekend before, and that was the first time we had played in two and a half years. And this was the first time that we played our new album. The first show with him was our third show back in two and a half years. So we were completely just thrown into the fire. <laughs> wow. And uh, it was amazing. And now I'm hungry for more, obviously. I mean, I, now I can't wait to play live again. That's so cr- it's so cool that you started off and just were had stage fright and now you're like absolutely love it. I wonder if it's like a sign if you're, I mean, there's a book I was reading. It's called The Obstacle is the Way. It's based on Seneca, I think. This guy, Ryan Holiday. I don't know if he wrote it, but he he reads it. I don't think he did write it. And it's all about that wherever you're feeling resistance, that's the thing you have to go after. So I wonder when you were younger, it was kind of telling you like, no, you're actually going to love it. Yeah, I I don't know. It's just, it's a weird thing. It's almost like a roller coaster ride. Like you're scared as hell before you go on. But after you do it, you're like, okay, let's do this again. You know, <laughs> keep doing it. Yeah, it's totally that feeling, I think. So how do you get involved? So you do the Vacant Annies thing. And then when do you get asked, like, when does Chris approach you and say, I have, a, I have these songs I'm recording. I want you to do background on a couple. I Like, I can't remember specifically the moment or anything, but I it, it kind of like overlaps with the beginning of Rocking Horse a little bit. Because we were friends and kind of hanging out, like, yeah, he just said that he had this music and, like, he wanted to see, you know, if I could put anything to it. I'm sorry, my dog's drinking some water right now. <laughs> okay, I heard, I heard him in the, I heard her here. She's in the background. It's I was not like, me. It's not me. <laughs> I hear you, like, you're kind of waving, like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't remember exactly, like, how it happened, but I, I do remember specific moments of, like, practicing and working on that with him. But, yeah, I mean, he just, he had this music and he just said, you know, Let's see if we can do something together on this, I guess. Something like that. So, yeah. Did he, like, show you any demos of what he did? Um, No, I think he just played it for me because we didn't really, like, you know, record demos like that, like we do now. So I think he was just playing it with his acoustic guitar for me. And then it was, like, just – and I remember, like, you know, him playing uh, Age Six Racer for me. And then I just started like singing along and just came up with this thing. And that's how that kind of developed. It was just very organic, you know? Wow. It wasn't like I took it home and, and really like worked on it. I don't think, I don't remember anything like that. When you listen to that record then before it comes out, were you thinking like, holy shit, this is going to, this is going to explode? I didn't really know. I, I mean, I was like young and I wasn't really paying attention to that too much. Like what's going to happen with this? And Or just the way it sounded like, were you... Was it as catchy to you as it was to basically millions of people afterwards? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always loved, I, still to this day, Chris has like one of my favorite voices. And, and he does that soft thing also, you know. Of course, yeah, I loved it. And I, and I sang along to it and everything. So, yeah, of course. I just didn't really think like beyond like, wow, this is going to blow up. You know, it wasn't like a thought that crossed my mind really because I guess I was somewhat part of it. So it's like didn't really think of it that way, I guess. I didn't really know, you know, didn't have any idea what was going to happen. And it was fun to watch. What was the overlap here again between like the Rock and Horse winner and then you recording the vocals for that? Like you said you were already in the band? Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I can't remember which came first, but it was kind of like in a similar time frame. And we, with Rocking Horse, like we recorded some demos. We recorded a few demos and we put them out on like a homemade like paper uh, cover with like a, a rip with a, like a CDR or something like that. I think um, I still have some of those like covers that we cut out and made and everything that my husband drawn with the bass player for the band. He's he's actually in Darling Fire also, but uh, he made the he made that and we printed them out at Kinko's or something. I don't know. And then we cut them out and glued them together and made like a sleeve and <laughs> gave them out as like demos like people used to do at shows. It was kind of it's kind of like hazy for me to try to remember exactly the the sequence of events but that was all starting during like the early dashboard stuff so when that record comes out and then you guys are doing racking horse winter and so that band starts in when 99 yeah 99 is when i joined them i think it was april 99 or something like that so when you join them and then and when dashboard comes out does that give you guys more of a 
like to are more people paying attention to you because they knew that it's like oh it's the singer who does the background you know she did the background on that on this dashboard record yeah i think there was some of that definitely and it wasn't like now where well now there's so much music in your face all the time it's hard to like find things also sometimes ironically but it wasn't like you know, still to this day, people are, don't know that I did that stuff with Dashboard. But definitely some of that was mentioned with our new band, with the band, as far as me doing that. And it, I'm sure it did help get our name out there. It wasn't like really, really in your face, though, where it almost became kind of annoying. You're like, oh, yeah, I did that, but this is the band I'm giving you. So like, like so I feel like sometimes you could be a little pressure where you're doing something and people have expectations because they heard you before and put pressure on you. I don't know, but it sounds like it did that didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely, like, I wanted our band to have its own thing and not ride coattails of somebody else. You know, I definitely didn't want that to, like, be, like, the only thing, you know, the only reason or whatever. So it wasn't like, you know, we're doing this band, let's use my thing that I do with Dashboard for us. You know, it wasn't, like, done that way, like, intentionally as far as we go. But, to, you know, people still ask about it and it's part of my history you know it's the part of my start my start in music so i'm totally happy to talk about it it's something i still remember as if it just happened you know so so rocking horse winter starts and how because you said you were on evr right yes the first album was actually released by my boyfriend at the time who uh, started this label ohev records he put that album out the first one and then after that i my husband's probably better with memory as far as how the EVR thing started, but I believe we sent them the first album and then it led to us getting signed and releasing Horizon. Because you go from having stage fright and then you're fronting this band. So how quickly playing <laughs> shows were you like, all right, I'm, I'm fucking into this? Yeah, uh, I'm sure it was still weird, like like to go back to the vacant Andes. And I, I don't know if Chris will remember this or not or whatever, but or if the guys in that were in Bacon Andes will remember this, but any show that they were going to do, because we actually did play and she was live a couple times. Um, so any show when I, when I would go, when I would go to the show and I knew that I had to do that part, I would get so nervous <laughs> about having, like I would be waiting the whole set for them to call me up there and I'd be like, fuck, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and there, I actually have a picture of one of the shows and I think it was like, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was actually a show that we played with one Blink-182. It was it was a small, pretty small club, but they opened for Blink-182. I think they may have, I can't remember which slot they played, but, um, and I was like, oh man, I have to get up there any minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that was before Rocking Horse played anything. So I did have a little bit of the live experience before we actually got to the point where we were playing shows. But yeah, I mean, even even later on when Rocking Horse did a run with Dashboard and we played, I remember in Philly. Yeah, we played a, a club in Philly and it was packed. And before the show, like right before he we went on stage, I almost vomited. Actually, I was so nervous. Like, how did it, how am I, how is this happening right now? The inverse really was like loved fucking with you. It's like, oh, you don't like being a, you, you have stage fright. Great, we're gonna put you in front of uh, huge crowds. Exactly. Just make you super vulnerable to sing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. No pressure. What was like the timeline around this too? Because when you're doing Rocking Horse Winter, like, how, what's the parallel of Further Seems Forever happening around this? Yeah. So Further was happening also around the same time, and um, we actually did a tour, and it was dashboard further and rocking horse that was so fun because we were all friends and i think that may have been where steve filled in for drums for us <laughs> actually on that trip because our drummer got sick matt so it was all kind of happening around the same time i guess you know it was all overlapping yeah i guess i asked that because he had filled in a couple times so i was trying to think of it was that because further had i mean because i guess they didn't really break up because chris chris left and then they got um Jason. Jason. So when you went on tour with them, was Jason fronting further? Um, I think it was Chris. So Chris was doing double duty? I think so. Oh, that's weird. I thought he left and did Dashboard and after because he quit Further Seems Forever. You know what? I oh man. I, I have to I'm not positive, but I thought I thought Chris did that one, that run. I'm not sure. It may have been Jason. I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, because when you said that, I was like, wait, I I've it's you know I mean it's whatever this is this this is like seventeen year old or nineteen year old me like 
talking right now where I'm like, I thought they were all like hated each other. And, you know, it's all the drama and shit that was going on. And it was just like, that's weird that they would have, he would have gone on tour with them. But yeah, so maybe it was Jason then. I, I'm not sure. I have, I actually, I have to see what year that was because I still have like the, those poster, these posters that were made for it. So it may have actually been Jason then. I think, I think you're right. So you guys start, you, you put out the demo and then you get signed to Equal Vision. What does that look like when that happens? Does it really boost the band or did they not really do what you wanted them to? No, they were awesome. We did a lot of stuff during that time. And yeah, no, they definitely helped us a lot. It was really good for us. It was strange because although they had had some like softer bands over the years on the label, because we were on EVR, we were, we were always playing with like heavy bands. And we were like the soft like who? band. Give me, like, what are some examples of some bands? I can't remember. Like it, there were just like a lot of heavy bands that nece- weren't necessarily EVR bands. But I mean, like the EVR showcase, we were playing with Converge. <laughs> I think we were the softest band on that. I feel like that would have worked though. There's something about soft bands and super aggressive bands like Converge. I don't. I don't know. I feel like that would work, or just be a fucking disaster. Yeah. Well, th- here's the irony. For example, we just played that run with Anthony Green, and it was his solo project. And before us was a band, Work Wife, and she's also a solo project. So we were like, how is this going to go? Because we are, like, really fucking heavy live. And it was actually awesome. I mean, it was it actually worked. People were like, okay. <laughs> you know, and it worked. I mean, it was really fun. And, and it was ironic because here we are, like, the heaviest band on the bill Whereas back in the day, we were like the softest band on the bill in most cases. So it was like the opposite. It works. Yeah, it works because there's like another dimension to, to the sh- live show, I guess. You know, it's like, yeah, you're not just hearing loud shit the whole time or soft shit the whole time. It's like it goes from soft to loud to soft to whatever, you know. It's a little palate cleanse there. Ex- and that's what's funny is, you know, we were told work wife's boyfriend was there and he said he told us that we were the palate cleanser, which I thought was hilarious. Oh, because we're, I'm like, really, we should be the opposite. <laughs> like we're the, we're the ones that, you know, are in your face and then, you know, you can rest after that or something. But he told me we were the palate cleanser, which I thought was hilarious. What was like the, so for Rock and Horse Winter, what was like, explain to people like what the style was and like, I don't know, what was the vision of the band? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, now it would be called emo, I guess. We were more like on the soft, like poppy side, I would say. Um, there was some influence from, you know, the the guys in the band were all from As Friends Rust. So they actually wrote the first album or something, I think. So they came from a heavy background musically. So there was a little bit of that in there. But because of the vocal, it was more pop-ish, I guess you could say. Um, so it's like, I guess, whatever came out, basically. I mean, the guitar player was writing the song, most of the, you know, music. It was like verse, chorus, verse type of stuff. And I guess catchy. But it wasn't like we sat down and said, let's do this. It was just the way it came out. I find it so weird that there's this thing, and, and, you know, this could be just a very blanket statement or just a very specific statement to Florida. But it's like you guys have all these heavy bands and... Then they leave and do these very soft bands. Like Chad, he's the singer of Shy Hulu, and he leaves and does Newfound Glory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the dudes from Ads Friends Russ leave that, and then they do, you know, your guys' band. It's just, it, yeah, it's just funny how that seems like, it's like their souls are like, oh, I just really want to just write poppy music and not this heavy stuff. Yeah, I just need a break. I guess, I guess people do that. Like they go through ebbs and flows in their music musical career. Like they want to do something like this and then they want to do like an electronic project and then they want to do a solo thing. They just want to test out the waters of, you know, different styles, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, you can hear the influences in, in the album, even though it's like more on the soft side. But I think you can still hear their kind of like sensibilities. So did you guys tour? We did, actually. We did. Oh, I know you said before that you did a tour with Dashboard and Further Seems Forever. So, But I don't know if that's like that was it or you done you did like a ton of them. No, uh, we didn't do a ton necessarily. We did do one over the West Coast and we did a couple East Coast tours. And then we would play festivals and things like that. Like we played the, the last show that we played before the band broke up was uh, South by Southwest. We also would play other festivals like we we played Gainesville Fest before it was the the gigantic fest that it is now. Actually, we were just talking about Gainesville Fest. Actually, it was that's what we called it then was Gainesville Fest. And it was just like in this little place in the woods. 
people would like camp out outside and wait for the thing to start. And it was like, you know, everybody packed in a room basically and some crazy antics. <laughs> like what? I think it was Hank Shaw. Do you know? I, uh, I interviewed, um, I interviewed Harold. <laughs> Oh, you interviewed. That's right. You did Harold. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I, I wanted to listen to that. It's why he's a wild dude. He's so funny. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. So I, I think it was I'm pretty sure it was Hank Shaw that one of the guys played nude the whole time. <laughs> um, so shit like that would happen, you know, and it's just like, oh my God. and I remember going to one of them and I we weren't playing. I don't think we went there and just like camped out in the car, slept in the car all night with like in the freezing cold. Oh, and uh, it's just that's what people do. We just go there and like have this big gathering and then leave. You know, it was like so fun. And it was just a bunch of bands from from the area and sometimes from out of the area. I'm looking at your Wikipedia and it says you played Mac Rock. Yes, that was the one I was just trying to think of. Yeah. Yeah. My old band, we played that one. We did it once. It was like 90. No, was it? No, it was 2000. I think. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was 2000. It was like April of 2000. And. This is this was I don't know I don't know how many times they did it. I thought it was like once, but their piebald played and I was talking to Travis and I was like there's a story about one of you guys getting naked and like jumping on a <laughs> on a roof of a house or so, like being on the roof of a house or something like that. <laughs> Do you remember the story from playing there? No, there? I don't. Okay, cuz that might I don't know if it was one year or two. Actually, let me click on the Wikipedia thing cuz it might tell me that. But I was like, it, it would just be weird if, if I was there. It's just so ironic if I was there too the same time like you guys played there, which kind of makes sense. Actually, I have, I have, uh, somebody posted a, I think a video of, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to remember, but I think recently I came across a video of I actually uh, sang Age Six Racer with Chris um, at that Mac Rock because we also played, so we played the same venue uh, you know the same uh, night or whatever i think somebody took a video of that and that was pretty crazy <laughs> to see all these years later did you like enjoy getting up there and playing that song with him or did you kind of oh, yeah. okay so some people they they ha- they'll like be a part of something and they want to get away from it but it sounds like no, that was the no 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 totally it was yeah i mean it's like there's something about that because at that point everybody knew who he was and everything. So people are singing along and it's like, I get very emotional when I hear people singing along to something that I was part of. So hearing all those voices while I was doing that part was just crazy for me. I mean, at that point, I think he was used to it because he had been doing that, but I hadn't witnessed that because I wasn't going with him on tour or anything, you know? So that's pretty crazy. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, that was like the famous thing back then is he would just get up and play by himself and the entire crowd would just overpower him by singing louder than him. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's awesome. And they would sound in tune all the whole time, all of them together, you know. When you got up there and did this, was this when he was by himself or when he had the full band? Um, no, I think it was just he and I, actually. That's even more intense. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's just so crazy. And I'm sure I was nervous as hell then too. But, you know, once you're up there and everybody's like, singing along it's just you know magical when did you start getting developing your stage presence where you felt comfortable and you started taking like control of you know what you were doing on stage um this past weekend i guess (laughs) oh good it just finally kicked in (laughs) just just finally kicked in no i mean you know like i'm always maybe changing or like figuring out what i'm doing you know it's just like or like where you felt confident and like when you're doing Rock and Horse Winter and you finally, you get less freaked out. I mean, there's always, you always get like nerves before you go on, which is, which I've heard that if you, someone said to me one time, like when I was doing plays when I was younger, they're going, if you don't feel nervous before you go on, that's a bad sign. That means you're probably going to fuck up. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Definitely like when you're on a tour and after the first show breaks the ice, that's when you're like, okay, yeah, this is really fucking fun. And I want to do this again tomorrow, <laughs> you know? So, so I think like after the, f- maybe like halfway into the first set of, of a tour or something is when that starts to go away. Well, I'm reading a list here and it says uh, that you toured in the United States several times and you played with like Coheed, Bayside, Blood Brothers. Yeah. Like, so I don't know. Yeah, okay. So what was that? Oh, I, I have mean- some, I have some stories. <laughs> Tell a story. I mean, they don't have to be crazy stories. They're just like whatever you want to tell. But there's like, there's something in there where that's like, hey, we started a band, we got signed to Equal Vision, we broke up. But in between there, there's these little tiny nuances and stories. That's what 
that's what makes this like it, it opens this whole thing up. Oh, I have some I have some stories. <laughs> well, with Kohi, like I have a, I have a very uh, cool story actually. You know, they were like blowing up at the time and we we got to go on, on a run with them. Um, there was one period where we got snowed in actually in Detroit and we couldn't go to the next show. Um, so that happened, but very cool memory that I have with Coheed is that we were playing this, I, th- I think it was Kentucky and probably people that went to the show will remember this, but it was like a little art gallery. Coheed was blowing up. So the art gallery was like a hundred cap or something or not even, I don't know. There was a huge line down the street and I felt bad because all these people came to see him and us or whatever. I mean, I don't know how we were doing at that time, but definitely at least to, to see Coheed. I found Claudio and I was like, you know, all these people are like waiting in line. They can't even come in. You know, it sucks. They, they want to see the band, you know. I asked around. I was like, is there anywhere we could like take this after the show and like let the rest of the people see? I don't remember how exactly, but I, I found out about this like skate park um, indoor and I was like, oh, well, shit, let's do that. Like, we can just do acoustic. And so I went to Claudio. I was like, are you cool with, like, doing an acoustic set after this at the skate park? And so all these people went to the fucking skate park. Oh, that's dope. And it was such a magical thing. I mean, people are sitting on the ramps and, like, just watching us play. And, like, we just might – our drummer had, like, all this bag of tricks, like, all these little shakers and all kinds of shit. And I think we handed out some of the little instruments that he had, like, little um, percussive instruments. And people were playing the shaker and all and tambourine and whatever along to our set. And it was just – we just did, like, a few songs each or something like that. And it was – fucking amazing that's one of my favorite moments of tour ever i think that's so cool i mean just i think there's a lot of things in life where you're it's 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 like you didn't plan for it but in the moment you're it just presented to you of like this would be kind of cool and it just came to me came to me right now like what if we did this and then you do it and it's one of your favorite memories ever yeah it's totally one of my favorite memories that i always remember yeah that was fun. And then with Bayside, like we did a couple of runs with them, I think. We had a very interesting, I have an interesting story with them also. Um, I can't, it was somewhere in Florida and Anthony was like, there's this place that we've stayed before. It's fucking crazy. He's like, trust me, let's stay there. It's really going to be weird. So we're like, great. okay, great. <laughs> what are we in for? You know? So it's this like halfway house or something. And I, it's fucking the craziest thing ever there was like a a cordon off room with like antiques in it that we couldn't go into it was a house a house and it was like people would just stay there like i don't know it was bizarre there was a guy i think his name was johnny or something and they were like yeah johnny's crazy like he'll go in the backyard and and just they had chickens so he would like break their necks in the middle of the night or something like that weird bizarre shit Jesus. But it's, it's like, and, and so like forever after that was like an inside joke with Anthony. Like, what the hell? <laughs> you took us to this fucking weird place. And it was just like this hilarious, like memory, just bizarre. I mean, it's like sleep with one eye open type of shit. Like, <laughs> am I really staying here tonight? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where was this? This was in Florida? Yeah, it was somewhere in Florida. You don't know, you don't remember which part of Florida? No, I can't remember what city it was i feel like that would be like gainesville or like eh, gainesville <laughs> definitely not orlando yeah. <laughs> no no it wasn't orlando i can't oh, i wish i could remember exactly where it was it was crazy crazy i wonder if there's like people who listen to this podcast that were <laughs> they'd be the, like oh i live there yeah <laughs> like we're in the there they were there or that was them and they're like yeah. listening to us and they're like, yeah, that was me. That was a weird fucking And they're going to he- hear me shit talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. Oh, boy. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> How was playing with the Blood Brothers? Did we? I don't remember. Uh, it says it on Wikipedia, so I'm just kind of like spitting off some names here. Could be. Could be. I don't. That I don't remember. Okay, so that wasn't remember memorable. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We one that is, another one that's that I remember is weaker than. So we played with them. That was um, members of Propagandi. Propagandi. We did a little run with them. Also, that was awesome. They were they're awesome. You did a run with them, like you played. I think we did like a couple shows or something. Pretty sure. Yeah, that was awesome. Do you remember what album they were touring on at that time? 
I think it was. It had to be the first one, I guess. Well, it says. Do you know what? You, well, you guys started ninety nine, and then you yes. ended in two thousand three. So if I'm their discography is on Wikipedia and Fallow that came out in ninety seven, and then Left and Leaving was the one that really blew them up. Left and Leaving. It was Left and Leaving. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. what the side that song that like was their hit. You know, kind of like underground hit. I love that fucking song. Yeah, it was Left and Leaving, definitely. Yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. People lost their fucking minds over the weaker thins. Yeah, the, well, it's good shit. It was, it was good <laughs> shit. Like, but I remember I was in Chicago, and this guy, um, Anthony, he introduced me. He's like, yo, you got to check this band out. It's just fucking will blow your mind. And listen to it, and it was Left and Leaving. And I was like, this is it's good. I, you know, I heard a side. I think I'm getting the name right. It is a side, right? Yes. Yeah, a side. Yep. I loved it. Yep. That song I was sold on. I was like, this is great. And then everything else was just so chill. And But everyone was like, this is the greatest band. And I saw them live. And, and I was like, it's good. I'm like, but it's, it's, they're kind of like super chill. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm expecting this this crowd to go. And the crowd is just sitting there just like, you know, bobbing their head a little bit. I'm like, yeah, what the yeah. fuck am I missing here? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have like just very minimal memories of that little trip, but it was fun, and I and I loved uh, Propagandi too. So, oh fuck yeah, um, it was cool to play with them members. So, like, what's going on in the band at this time? I mean, how many you had the demo, and then you put the record out on EVR. Like, how many releases did you do? Well, we had the first album, State of Feeling Concentration, and then we put out Horizon on EVR. There was like mixed mixed response from our listeners at the time because some people thought it was like more and even we thought that it was like more you know more produced whereas like the first album had more of this like charm to it that was like not so clean and crisp wait so people didn't like that no they did but you know how everybody was about like selling out and shit Uh. (laughs) so so not that we were really selling out i mean by any means but like just people felt like maybe the first album had a certain charm that was missing on the second album because it was more like even more pop and produced. But I mean, I think more people know about that album than the first one. So what's going on? Like, are you guys getting more recognition at this point? And, you know, what's 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 happening then? Yeah, totally. I mean, we had like some kind of feature in Seventeen magazine, which is weird. <laughs> Wait, talk about that. What's this? So we did, we did like... Actually, somebody just shared this like recently. There was like a spread on emo, and there was even a a guy and girl or something dressed emo and like how to be emo. And it was us and Dashboard and Jimmy Eat World. That was weird. And I, I don't know how it all, I don't remember how it all came together. I just remember going to New York City and like taking photos for it and stuff like that. <laughs> so strange. That's so weird. It was just when people were starting to like, discuss like emo and what that meant is this around the time where when like emo game came out remember that what's that you remember the emo emo game no really no enlighten me (laughs) oh my god it was this i talked with jason from absolute punk because we were talking about that whole era and shit and i was like do you remember emo game he's like oh my god i love that thing it was a game that they made the characters that you played were emo singers and like caraba was in it who the fuck else was in it? It was like all of these emo people. They, but it was like you played the game as them. Weird. No, I never. Now I'm. Now I gotta find this. I have to find this now. It was pretty cool. <laughs> let me see. Let me see. Like, I'm, I'm missing. That's hilarious. I think like Coheed was in it too. Yeah, it was like really popular. It was kind of like when the internet started. It was like when Flash came out, and then people started doing Flash websites and animated stuff, and then they realized they could make games and stuff. So it was just when it was a weird time because you know, and actually, we want to talk about this, like how the sound transition from the late '90s and 2000s was, and your perspective on that. But it's like the early 2000s. The internet's blowing up. Everyone's downloading. So it's like all this. It was like good and bad, where the music kind of got fucking weird, but some really good stuff came out of it, and some really awful shit came out of it. But then the internet's opening up this door where people are like, we can do all this creative stuff. Like we start blogs, and you know, Jason does like do like absolute punk, and then this guy's like, we could do a video game. Yeah. And, uh, it was like it was a cool time to see all that stuff. But yeah, that was one of the things that came out of that. Um, but to the point of like when it got weird. Like, what was your thoughts when it transitioned from? like the late 90s into 2000, did you, you know, with the band, did you feel that you were connected to what was going on or did you feel that you wanted to separate yourselves from what was happening around you? 
I don't know that I was really like thinking about about that too much. I think we had like a lot of pressure on ourselves to try to do something special with the band. But as far as like you mean being part of the emo scene or whatever? Yeah, you know, I think I think it happened to do more where people were not really feeling it when they were a band that started in the mid to late 90s and they were in that whole punk and you know, part where California like the California scene was huge, so everyone would sound like no effects and that fat record sound. And then like then it starts to kind of you know the emo thing starts to come in, but then ska was there for like a hot second, and that burned out like super third wave burned out pretty fast. I feel like it was less of a fashion show, which I already talked about. And then the two thousands hits, and everyone was like, oh, it's about how you look and how your fucking hair is and all that shit. Yeah, and everybody wearing black and black nails and everything. yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think like the idea of emo was kind of changing and encompassing more music, more bands, I guess. So I guess it was. I mean, like I said before, I think we didn't really call ourselves emo. You know, I guess anything at that time could have been emo because it's emotional lyrics and things like that. But yeah, it wasn't like we were like, let's not be part of this movement specifically. So you weren't a fan of it? Um, No, I mean, we weren't like saying, you know, oh, we don't want to be part of this it wasn't like that, really. I don't think it was really on our minds whether or not we were part of it. We were being lumped into that, I think, definitely. But I don't think we were specifically like, you know, let's not get involved with this or anything. It wasn't like that. I guess it just comes it gets from my point of view of, like, I was looking at that whole scene. I mean, I got out of it in, like, 2000, 2000 like, the beginning of 2001, I got out of the whole thing. And I was like, eh, I'm over this. You know, I don't want to play music anymore and shit like that. And, um... But I'm watching everything around just blow up because AP magazines in my face and show me like, here's the new hot trends and everyone's got to look like this. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah, it is weird because, yeah, cause, because it became more commercial. I guess that's what you're saying. Like it became more commercial and it was like, uh, this is kind of weird. <laughs> what you're doing naturally or organically is being turned into this commercial product. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, totally. Yeah, they're like, they're, that's why the, the podcast, like this podcast called This Was The Scene, it was about that time when it was like really cool and you felt community and then that just really started to disperse in that time. So it's like when you guys are doing your whole run and of course you end 2003, so you miss the rest of the early 2000s, but but in that whole time, like all this stuff is like kind of transitioning. I mean, it, it could have worked in your favor against some bands that really worked for them and they just just went with it and other bands were like, I just don't want to be showing up and just playing these shows, these fucking idiot bands that are <laughs> so annoying yeah yeah i can see what you mean i mean yeah it, it was weird to like be kind of in that moment where things like 17 were putting out articles about how to be emo yeah <laughs> it is weird you know because it's like you know because i guess we did have that like small scene and we wanted it to be special and then ever it's being taken over and becoming something commercial it's kind of weird well, what do you like at this point when you're playing and touring stuff? Are you guys like having a conversation in the band of, all right, what's next? Like, let's keep going. Or were you guys just like, we're just kind of doing this for the moment and then we're going to just, yeah, you know, it's fun and then we don't really want to take it anywhere? I think we intended to keep going, but we were young and we kind of like let the pressure get to us. And that's what basically in the end defeated the band. What what was the pressure? Just the pressure on ourselves to like we wanted the, it to be a, what we did for a living, and it was working, but it wasn't enough. We just kind of pressured ourselves to do certain things to get to a certain level, and I think we were just young and stupid, and so we let the we let that get to our to our, us, and which ended in you know just um, stupid arguments and just you know bickering and stuff like that. Who was your boyfriend at the band at the time? Uh, Geronimo is now my husband. Okay, so you guys started dating at this, like in the band or before the band? In the band, shortly after the band got together. So does that cause any kind of, you know, does that cause any rifts at all between the rest of the members <laughs> at all? Um, I think in a way, because we were still, it was still like kind of a new relationship, which I mean, people ask us about this all. It's like, how the hell did you, were you in like a touring band or whatever with this relationship? And how did you get through that? <laughs> you know, 
And it's like, yeah, there were moments, I think, probably where he sided with me on things or vice versa. And maybe the other guys felt like it was us against them or whatever. We also tried to see their point of view on things and not be, let it be about that. So it wasn't always like that. He didn't agree with me and vice versa on everything. Yeah, it is weird because I remember when we before we started dating, he asked the guys, like, are you guys cool with me with us dating, like if I wanted to pursue that or whatever. And they were like, yeah, sure. That's awesome. You know? Um, but of course it's like challenging because we're in a van with other people all day, every day. (laughs) It's like, you know, no matter how hard you try, it's still weird. And it's hard not to, it's hard to separate that and not side with each other, but we tried to keep it separate as much as we could. Did you find that it actually, I mean, since I'm guessing the answer is more um, obviously positive because you're married now. Did you find that that time period of doing that made you guys a stronger couple? Probably, yeah, because we share that history. And, you know, we can, and all those tour stories we share, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think it, it it made us stronger. And we, and it wasn't easy, you know, because we were young also. And, and uh, you know, we were all young, so. Even, you know, being in a, in a band together and having all these thing, weird things happen for the band and then, and then trying to maintain a relationship also and, and have time alone and things like that was like not easy. There was one time where me and my other singer, we got in this huge fight in Virginia Beach, <laughs> but still had to play a show and we did it. And when we got on stage, I was like, oh, I think we're fine. Then we got off stage and was like, I fucking hate you again. Mm-hmm. Did you have any of those moments? Oh, Yeah. Um, specifically South by Southwest, the final show. Mm -hmm. So what happened was we came back from a tour and I can't remember who we were, who we were with or if it was just us. We came back and actually the, I think it was the axle on the van broke. And so we basically like, (laughs) somehow we made it to the nearest gas station and got it repaired. But that was like, the final straw because I think we had had like some bad, some canceled shows or something like that. Some things happened that weren't good on the tour. When we got back, we were like, that this is done. Like it's too much. We can't do this anymore. Uh, but EVR re- insisted on us playing South by Southwest. So we were like, can we just like put our differences aside and just play this one thing? So we basically flew there, right? I think we flew. Yeah. I think we flew there and we were like exhausted and we played South by Southwest, and then after that, the band broke up. I think I read, like, a review of our set, and people could tell that we were not friends anymore. <laughs> really? At that point, yeah. And that's not the case anymore, by the way. I mean, now we're friends. Now we're, you know, that we were young and stupid, like I said, so we let things get in the way. But, yeah, you could tell that our energy was not in it, and we were basically forced to play that and we didn't want to and we did it reluctantly because we wanted to fulfill an obligation you know Mm. um but yeah that's definitely one of those moments (laughs) so you were just mad because you were were you mad at each other were you mad as a band or were you mad that you had to play it and you all decided were you like mad at evr basically oh no no it wasn't evr's fault at all no just as a band like we were bickering about stupid things and and about writing music and you know, things like that. And just in general, and I think we were just worn out because like I said, we were putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to achieve something that was difficult, but it had nothing to do with EVR. They were awesome. Always. How old was everyone at this time? Like what was the average range or average age, average age range? We would have been in our early to mid twenties, I think. So, yeah. It's funny you said that, that you're all friends now, which makes total sense because I think when people are on the same, what's the word? Trajectory. And they're not all going to the same place, then you're kind of blaming someone for holding you back and you're kind of annoyed at them. But once, as soon as you break the band up, you have no ties with each other in your futures together. Like whatever your future's going, they have no say in that really, unless you're dating them. That's a different story. So that's when you can like relieve that pressure and just hang out with them without that. Hey, we have to go do this thing together, which we all hate now. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, of course, there's a lot of regret behind that because I who knows what would have happened if we would continue just writing just one more album. So, you know, it's it's a sad thing, but it happens, you know, and that's it's just the way that it was meant to happen, I guess, you know. How many band members are in the Dong Fire? Uh, Five band members. 
how many from the original band, from um, R- Rock and Horse Winner? Just Ron and I. Oh, okay. And then, but Steve, though, even though he played for a second. Yeah, and Steve, the unofficial Rock and Horse Winner member. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what's different now? I mean, obviously, how do you treat it differently now? Oh, yeah, completely different. We try not to put the same level of pressure on ourselves. We're lucky to do this again. I mean, I had done some things in between for friends and with friends and projects and, you know, other backup things. And, and now it's like totally different. It's like we're trying to do it for fun and just, you know, be thankful for any little opportunity we get, you know, and not take it for granted. And I think that's the best way to do it and not expect and just at any moment it could end and just try to talk out anything that comes up that we don't like and um, be, you know, and communicate (laughs) about things. And I think that's the best way to do it. What's it like to, I mean, you said you just did like a little run in Florida. How many shows did you play? Uh, That was four shows. How far away was each show from each other? Yeah, we did. So we basically, um, because we live in Florida, we were able to come home every night um so it was it was a test definitely (laughs) so each show you know it was from anywhere from an hour to four hours basically you would drive four hours play a show and then drive home yes get the hell out of here why don't you just like (laughs) you guys everyone has jobs i'm guessing and like can get an airbnb and have like a nice stay somewhere yeah but well we have dogs so we had to come (laughs) back for the dogs we had (laughs) dogs it's funny how everything changes (laughs) yeah we don't have kids but we have dogs (laughs) <laughs> so we had to come home for the dogs and yeah but I mean it was a challenge because it was like okay this is we're gonna see can we handle this long term you know this is gonna be the test like if we really want to do this can we handle this little run play a show which mind you was the the shows didn't end that late but I mean it was literally play the show uh hang out for a little bit get grab a bite to eat and then come home Sleep, get up, go back. <laughs> oh, there. so you did this literally four days in a row. Oh, yeah. Fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> no fucking way. Trust trust me, the adrenaline keeps you going. Oh, my God. Oh, and, and the Celsius keeps you going. It's not sponsored, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I'd almost be like, let's find a dog walker to like take the dogs out and then we can like stay i don't know i'm just like such an adult like yeah. what's the word am i trying to say um i can't think of it it's like a gr- mcgrudgeon what is that what's the fucking word curmudgeon curmudgeon i'm like a fucking old curmudgeon right now i'm like god damn it no way i'm not driving that far yeah no it was fun though it was really fun i mean i thought we were gonna be completely exhausted by the end but the adrenaline and just like having the crowd and the energy and everything it feeds you and you just take little power naps when you can and <laughs> and drink a lot of caffeine and that's it <laughs> and you can do it shit you know what i've been taking recently that's been amazing fucking b12 mm, okay it, yeah. it it works it's like an it literally keeps you level all the time like yeah. i wonder if that would be a, a, a nice little help besides all the energy drinks which uh, fuck you up totally totally well actually celsius isn't that bad for you supposedly but you know in moderation i think <laughs> <laughs> but it's a healthier healthier alternative i think so going back when um you know when rock and horse winter breaks up who told the uh, equal vision that this happened i i think it was probably henry I think our guitar player. I'm not sure. It may have been him. And you know, it was it was not we I didn't like to do that and you know, break our promise to them that we were going to continue, you know, touring for the album and everything obviously. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't a nice way to go out. <laughs> but yeah, we I think it was pro- it was most likely him. Did you guys play with Armor for Sleep at all? I think we did actually. I'm just trying to think of what bands were on Equal Vision at the time. They were blowing up. Cirque Survive, they were starting to blow. Actually, no, they they started, I think they, they were more like 2000. That was after. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Okay. That was after us. We had like Strider, and I think I think Hope's Fall was on EVR at the time, pretty sure. Not sure. How was, uh, did you play any shows with Strider, the Strider? Yeah, we did, actually. I think they, they also played that CMJ, I'm pretty sure. They were cool. We didn't play that many shows i don't think with label mates but we did play we def- definitely did play some shows with them did it like give you any kind of boost 
being on that label where people would come to see you because you're on Eagle Vision? Um, could be. I mean, I don't know specifically, but I'm sure it did help. Definitely. I guess it's like a funny question to ask because people don't show up and be like, we're here because you're on Equal Vision. You're like, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you for, thank you. I can, it, it's helping with our metrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that it did help though, for sure. I mean, people, EVR was, you know, doing really well. Yeah. Um, actually, and real quick, I just sent you a link to Emo Game so you can see. Okay. Oh, thank you. Comments. Awesome. I, I got to, yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out after. <laughs> so what happens after, and I'm going to wrap this up soon, but like when the band ends, did you kind of lose yourself a little bit? Oh, it was definitely weird um, because this was this thing that we were doing for years and it just ends, you know. As far as like my husband goes, he sold all of his bass equipment, everything, bass equipment, all of it was gone. He was he was done. He was frustrated and he gave up at that point. With me, like it was weird to not do this thing anymore. So I did wait a little bit and then I think I did um, this other project called Popvert with these guys in Miami that was like, I guess pop-ish type of thing um, with some rock. And then I just would do like backups for friends and stuff like that, record some things with them and a little bit of live with one of my friend's bands. And that's really it until uh, Darling Fire. So, so yeah, we definitely, it was weird to like come back and just not have this thing to do anymore. Did you like at some point just not want to be involved in music, but you just didn't let yourself stop? Never didn't want to be involved, I would say. It's never that I, you know, I wasn't angry about things, the way things ended necessarily. It was like I wanted to keep doing something, but I just didn't find the right people, I guess, to do like an actual full-time band again. You know, it wasn't like the scene was different at that point, I guess, kind of maybe down here. And I didn't really, I didn't really seek out another like band and because it was like I had become fr- close friends with those guys, you know, so it's like I, it was like weird to do something with somebody else. What do you think, you know, if you could have like wave a magic wand at that time and had a band work out the way that you wanted to, what would it have looked like? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I wish that we, that Rocking Horse had written another album. I was interested to see what direction it was going to go. So I would have liked for that band to continue, actually. But like, like you have a magic wand, though. Like, what okay. would you, you know, and you could do whatever you want to. If that, <laughs> so if that was the case, the band stays together. Then you're like, if, if I had my druthers, I would have loved us to have gotten like this big or played this thing or did, sold this many records or I don't even know whatever you think. Oh well, I, you know, of course, like I would have loved for the band to get to the point where we could have just done that full time toured all the time, you know, written an, a kick-ass album, you know, the third one, because then by then we would have had plenty of practice and, you know, had maybe gone on to a bigger label and just made it our living. That would have been ideal. How long do you think you would have been able to do that for before you were like, eh? Uh, I don't know, because even now, like, it's weird. When I listen to the Rocking Horse songs um, and I hear myself singing on them I feel like I sound like a chipmunk (laughs) oh really (laughs) because I feel like my voice is so young like I can hear how young I am there and how like naive I was I actually can hear all of that and when I listen to it obviously it's emotional to listen to for me because it's like folding time almost so it is weird and I and sometimes I'll sing along to it and it's like my myself now singing to my young self that I could have a kid that age now you know it's weird (laughs) So it's like, I, but I can hear how naive I was and how we let that go. I was listening to, like, I'll put on Discover Weekly sometimes, even though a lot, I'd, I'd say like 99% of the stuff Spotify shows me is fucking garbage. Yeah. Um, I'm like, well, I'm like, this is crap. Like, what is this? But there's always this like one song here and there. And this band called Ambleside. Have you heard of them? No, I haven't. They sound like hot water, like a fresh version of hot water. And it's actually funny. They're they're right underneath hot water in this in the list. That's funny. Um so I'm like listening to that and I'm like, wow, like there's these young bands I love finding now because it's like this fresh sound and it's exciting. But a couple songs before that was some band and I'm listening to their lyrics and it's just like just 
the world's falling apart. It's like crushing their <laughs> spirit and shit. I'm like, I'm like, bro, you're like 17. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you haven't experienced anything yet. Exactly. And then, <laughs> but then it made me really think about the majority of stuff we listen to come from very young people and they're like maybe late teens in their early twenties. And that's like the, the sound that people still will gravitate to. And I'm like, I'm 43 years old and I'm like listening to this shit thinking like, and some of the stuff I'm like fired up. I'm like, yeah, but I'm like, but what's the message here? Like, are they angsty because they're (laughs) in their like early twenties? And then I'm relating to this, even though I'm so fucking far removed from anything they're going through. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, all I can say is life is difficult, you know, for everybody. And we were just talking about this like the other day, you know, my husband said like, if you if you've hit 40 and you're not fucked up in some way then there's something wrong with you because <laughs> because everybody has been through shit by our age you know it's like everybody's been through some kind of shit um especially you know obviously what's been going on the past few years but so i mean yeah it's it's funny because it's like the kids are going through this what they think is like a terrible time and they've seen nothing yet <laughs> but i'm thinking about even when we were younger the stuff Everything that molded us was about another. I mean, it makes sense because they were our age, and we could relate because we're like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, I hate this person yeah. because of they yeah. dumped me or some shit." But it's just weird to think that that as you keep going, it's just a new set of people that are staying in that age, and they're the ones writing the newer stuff that we're listening to. And you're just like, the music I'm listening to is basically being created by people that I'm 20 years older with, but I'm still finding ways to relate to it somehow. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like the struggle. <laughs> it starts young, I guess, and you know, it's like it, it may be a different kind of struggle, but it's like just trying to find your place in the world, I guess. And even at that age, you're like confused, and there's just so much going on. Yeah, it's I know it is funny to relate to relate to that still, you know. But I guess we're all just we're all still just kids, right? Well, I think <laughs> so. I think it's like the, the 18 year old in me p- comes comes out and just listens to it and it's like feels that again and i can totally relate to it like that it's and but some like sometimes i'm just like all right like i get it but maybe you should just i don't move out of your fucking house and like yeah. see what it's like to be on your own <laughs> first before being yeah. so mad <laughs> <laughs> well cool so uh, i'm gonna wrap this up but before i do uh we started asking this recently is there a story that you remember from back in the day that you've never got a chance to tell and now you can Oh, boy. Well, there's a story that everybody knows about us that knows us. That knows you? Or is this like you've said it on interviews and podcasts and things before? I don't think I've ever said this before. Um, but there there was – when we used to play Syracuse, there was a promoter. I think his name was Jeff. He would like to get us in trouble. <laughs> so he liked to start shit. There were two different instances where we ended up getting into a – an altercation with people because of him. And it was the irony that we were like this soft band and then we were getting in fights on tour because of this promoter. So I guess, I guess it was like this one particular moment where he was able to, I guess his, I think his friend worked at a movie theater or something like that. And so he was able to get his hands on the first Spider-Man movie and he had a screening for us and we were on tour with Branston at the time. And uh, we, it was like, you know, a couple of vans following each other to this movie theater, following Jeff and his girlfriend, I think. Somebody was like drunk driving really bad, severely. And all I remember is that somehow we ended up following him off the exit. And this person is, next thing I know, their glass is broken in their car and <laughs> they're fighting like physically and yelling and screaming and just, it was just bizarre. And so that was just one instance where we would get in these like little physical altercations, which was so against our character and what people saw of our band. Wait, so, (laughs) okay. I'm confused here. So you went to see Spider-Man and you're driving to see them. So you're in your van following a car in front of you. Who's drunk. We're following Jeff to the movie theater for the screening and he's and drunk. he's no he's following a car that's drunk in front of him that started acting erratically and so he followed this car off of the exit and just started got out and just started i don't know kicking their 
kicked in their windshield, their back windshield or their window or something like that. They had, I guess they had like bottles all over their car. They were completely wasted. And he just, for some reason, just felt like fighting them. So he started this whole thing. And I, I just remember like Branston and, and us, we were all out of the vehicles, out of the vans on the side of the on this, like exit of the highway as this thing is unfolding. And it's like, what is happening right now? So that was like one of our stories um, about fights. And it was always this guy, this promoter, Jeff. And hi, Jeff, if you're listening. He <laughs> used to get us into trouble all the time. And that, that was one of them. The way that you positioned that in the beginning – I thought you meant that there was a promoter in Syracuse who liked to put you guys in a situation where, or talk shit about you to people that when you showed up, everyone wanted to kick your ass and you had to fight your way out of it. Oh no, he would like to get- He would just like to scrap. Yes, and we would be there. And so he would like to get involved in it. (laughs) So that was just his thing. He just always loved to just- It was his thing. He He just liked, he thought it was fun to- start fights with people i guess i don't know <laughs> for some reason we were always there for that <laughs> okay okay i thought it was more like this guy just always f- like fucking fought us every time we went there no. i was like why would you go to his shows no he liked to incite shit ah okay there we go <laughs> i caught up what was another time what was another story like that another time was there were some kids that were walking by our van and they they ripped off a branch of a tree or something and they hit They hit the van with the tree branch, and next thing I know, all the guys are running, following him, of course, as usual, across the street to fight these people that had just hit our van with the with a branch. It ended up in like a a little bit of a brawl where they called the police, and we basically took off before the police. (laughs) We all ran and got in the van and just took off before anything else happened. Jesus. And it was just like so against our character. We're like, we're going to play this pretty happy music and meanwhile this shit is going on in the background (laughs) did you get any fights well that's the part i left out i think um the one where we got off on the on the exit was uh there was a girl in the car and she actually targeted me because i was the only female standing there and i ended up punching her in the face so nice (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah it was not, i'm not proud of that moment but i was yeah. gonna say like after you know <laughs> over time i wonder if that doesn't age well yeah it doesn't age well probably but it just happened you know i had to defend myself what was i supposed to do <laughs> oh my god so yeah but that's the kind of stuff that he would bring out in us and it was like you know when you're on tour and you're like kind of tired and hungry all the time and then this stuff happens you're like okay i guess this is happening right now <laughs> <laughs> oh my god did you have a moment where you're like, hey, let's not go to play any more Jeff's shows? Yeah, we knew that it was him that was the cause, always. You know, we're like, oh, fuck, we have to play in Syracuse again? Here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so pretty funny. All right, well, um, all right, so I'm going to wrap this up with two questions. Uh, one, what would you like to plug? It could be about you. It could be about your friend. It could be about both. Okay, um, well, I will say that we next week we're actually recording a video for Rituals, our newest single. So that should be fun. That, I think, will come out when the album comes out in September. When does it come out in September? Because I'm, ch- I'm trying to think of... Let me look at a calendar real fast to see when this is going to come out. So let's see, next week... 16th. Okay, so one, two, three, so that's that. So I got four. Yeah, yours is going to come out the, literally the day of, uh, of your, re- your album. Nice, perfect. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's really good timing. So I could say it's 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 available today, and they have a music video. So the music video is going to come out on the sixteenth. Yes, I believe so. Oh wow, you got a you got a you got a triple thing happening here. You got my stupid little podcast coming out, and <laughs> you got your record. Awesome, perfect. That's fucking cool. Um, actually, real quick, you have recorded the video, or you're going to? We're going to next week on Friday. What's the? Have you gotten like um? What's the write up of a of a of a video? What do they call that? Yeah, a premiere. No, um, no, like the it's like the the thought like the storyboarding of what it's going to oh, be. Oh, storyboarding. Yeah, w- the, actually we just started working on that today. So, um we ju- we're not exactly sure what's going to happen yet, but there will be some live some live and some and a little bit of story in there. So, like live meaning you guys in a controlled setting or are you in front of a uh, like a crowd? Controlled setting. 
I guess like quote unquote live, <laughs> but there will be some uh, playing and some some storyboard in there. Okay. Some storyline. Have you done a video? Have you ever recorded a video before? We did actually. We had. You mean in general or for this band? Just you in general. Have you ever been in a in a like a video shoot for where you're like the main act? Yeah, um, we actually did one for Miss You for Rocking Horse a long time ago. So we have that's floating around somewhere. And then uh, we did one for this band called uh, for the song Saints and Masquerade. And that was like actually my some of my family was in that were the actors. So this will be the third video that I've done. Oh, okay. I was going to say, like, I've never done a video before and I've seen, like, had friends who were in bands and did it. I was like, that always seems so cool back in the day, but it's got to be fucking weird. It is weird as hell because, you know, of course, because you're playing your song as if, you know, there's somebody there, but it's just the guy with the camera in front of you. So it is, it can be weird, but it's so, it's so fun. I mean, la- the last one we did, we basically, we did it in just like a day and a half and we just cranked it out and it just was, it happened so quickly and just like we had some happy accidents and things that happened, that came up that were awesome moments, you know, really memorable moments that made it into the video and um, we just kind of played around. And I think that's kind of some of what we're going to do this time too, just to see what happens, you know. That's cool. I'm actually looking at your. I'm I'm watching Miss You right now. It's on Equal Vision's YouTube. Okay. Oh, wow. So old. Yeah, it came out December 30th, 2008, and it's got 22,448 views. Yeah, it's been out a lot longer than that, but that that's probably when it made it there. Yeah. Yeah, when it made on it YouTube. to YouTube. Damn. Let's see. You got a lot of comments too. Really? I'll have to check those out. <laughs> <laughs> oh no you actually commented yeah three years ago you commented oh we did okay. yeah and you were like oh, check okay. out the darling fire nice oh yeah yeah that's smart plug <laughs> <laughs> all right so last question what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day i mean i would definitely say stay humble and and don't be an asshole you know i mean i i like you can tell when somebody thinks that um, they're more than they are. And I, I think just staying humble and being nice to people, you know, I mean, we had such a community back then and in the scene and uh, just, you know, being nice to people can go a long way because if you burn bridges now, like you're not later on down the road, you never know when you're going to need that person for something. So I think that's definitely something that I learned to do is like stay humble and appreciate what you have at all times.